I would like to welcome our panelists and the participants of today's presentation on training for future science diplomats. Uh, we will talk about various ways of training uh, for this very special career, and we will build upon a very solid foundation developed by the Horizon 2020 project on science diplomacy. We will definitely focus on the nuts and bolts of targeted training, and I would hope that many of our participants will follow our lead. Well, I'm talking to you from the Diplomatische Akademie Wien, uh, the oldest still existing diplomatic academy in the world. It was founded almost 300 years ago by a very strong lady, by the Habsburgian Empress Maria Theresia. She was a true sponsor of science, of education, and of research. She was also a very strong and inspired political leader. So, um, let me now introduce our two panelists, Maria Josten and Itzas Kuhn Lakunsa. Both are very eminent experts, researchers, and true ambassadors of the concept of science diplomacy. I will start with a short CV of Isas Kuhn Lakunza. She is a highly experienced science policy practitioner, currently running the International Projects Unit at the Spanish Foundation for Science and Technology. Isas Kuhn is focused on bringing science beyond the frontiers of academia. On one hand, she has coordinated the Science Advisors Network at Strategic Embassies of Spain and its collaboration with relevant civil and administration stakeholders. Moreover, Isas Kuhn is one of the Ciencia en el Parlamento, Science in Parliament coordinators. The Civil Society Initiative brings researchers and members of Parliament together to discuss the role of scientific evidence in the legislative process. Maria Josten studied banking and finances at the University of Varna in Bulgaria. And since 2005, she has been working in leading positions in the German Aerospace Center in the project management agency in the field of European and international cooperation in Bonn, Germany. She has been a senior scientific officer responsible for collaboration with Russia, and in the past years she has also involved in several European programs and collaborations with Eastern Europe, South Caucasus, and Central Asia. Currently, Maria uh, works in the strategy and monitoring division of this organization and supports the Federal Ministry of Education and Research in Germany with her uh, advice. Um, ladies and gentlemen, before starting with the first round of questions, I would like to draw your attention to two functions. We have a Q and A uh, function and a chat channel. So I encourage all participants and our public to use these two um, platforms frequently and to send us your questions and to exchange your ideas and comments amongst each other and with us. I would also like to take the opportunity to thank our graphic artist, Javier, for his graphic support of this session. Um, allow me, ladies and gentlemen, to start now with the first question, which I direct uh, at Maria. Dear Maria, what training activities did you plan at the beginning of S4D4C? Thank you very much, um, Susanne. Thank you very much uh, and welcome to all participants for our spotlight session today. Our working plan at the beginning of our S4G4C project was very, very ambitious, I would say. We have offered three main activities, which I would like to underline. The first one was an open doors program launched in October 2018. It was a program for young scientists uh, uh, dealing with science diplomacy and um, uh, interested in having some experiences in their early stage of their diplomatic and scientific career. 
We have received uh, more than 100 applications and five grantees have been selected. These grantees uh, visited uh, in the last two years uh, different events of uh, S4G4C and also of our partner project ELSID, but also the Spanish embassies in Brussels, um, in London, several ministries and funding organizations, research organizations, but um, also international organizations like United Nations University and also the European Space Agency in Germany, in Cologne and in Bonn. Take home message uh, was science diplomacy is core part of our democracy and I was very proud to hear that from our grantees. Secondly, I would like to mention that two um, workshops um, ha have been also organized during the project lifetime. One workshop in, uh, in Vienna in your organization, Susanne, and one workshop in Trieste uh, in, um, uh, organized by the World Academy of Science. And it was quite uh, impressive how many people, how many experts and scientists and diplomats um, have applied for these workshops. We have received more than 500 applications for 50 participants places. So um, we have a huge number of interested uh, persons. And I would like to underline that our experience has shown that a mixture between scientists and diplomats is key in in-person training. Networking is crucial for developing, uh, developing science diplomacy. And I think this was our key takeaway from both workshops. And finally, I would like to, to mention our S4D4C um, online course dedicated on European science diplomacy, which uh, was launched in May 2020. We have uh, uh, received more than 6,000 registrations and 600 experts have uh, already received a certificate. Uh, what an amazing result, I would say. And we were also very motivated to update this course. And um, we have just launched a new version we have several webinars, um, act, uh, eight modules within um, our course, um, more than 100 videos, um, more than 20 separated training materials. And I think we could talk long about our achievements, but I would like to stop here. Thank you, Mary, Maria, for this introduction. And I would like to pass the second question to Isa Skoon. What are you most proud of in relation to the work done in retrospect? Isa Skoon. Thank you, Susan, and uh, good afternoon to everybody. Uh, and in, I think that we are all very proud of what we have achieved with the training activities. But if I had to name something, I would probably mention three aspects. The first one is how we have understood training to this particular uh, target audience, let's say. The second one is that we have always had an innovation mindset when, when designing these trainings. And the third one is, of course, impact. So as for the first one that has to do with how we have understood training, I think that it, we were, um, it was a very good idea to understand it together with the networking activities, which is something that Maria already mentioned. I mean, we need to bear in mind that we are, um, training uh, professionals, some of them really seasoned in their own particular fields. I mean, we are we want to raise awareness about the importance of science diplomacy with diplomats, researchers. So we need to, um, when, we, when we think about their training, it needs to be with uh, the right approach. And that approach has always been about sharing experiences and um, personal views of people already practicing science diplomacy rather than giving them proper training. Actually, sometimes we haven't even used that name because, I mean, how are you going to be training a diplomat that with 20 years of experience? It is more about ra raising awareness, you know, uh, giving uh, giving what on the, the appetite for science diplomacy, something, something like that. And this connection in between networking and training was very useful uh, for the online course as well. So when we were uh, organizing the first networking event in Madrid, uh, we gathered their experts and practitioners of science diplomacy from all over the world. And we already had in mind what kind of curricula we wanted to put together for the online training. So what we did was to bring all those things together and we interviewed and record, uh, recorded, video recorded all these experts, putting them questions that were going to be super useful for the online training. 
So that expertise was, um, you know, offered to the to the participants in the ED online. As for innovation, actually, um, and I, I, I had a very good memory when we launched the online course. It was in the middle of the lockdown, and maybe because of that, who knows? But the truth is that all of a sudden we had thousands of participants to the online course. Uh, I have never seen something like that. I have to confess, and. Always with this idea of the networking in mind, it was a pity that, I mean, the online course is quite interactive, there is videos and such, but at the same time, it's a one-way online training. So the team, DLR, set aside our, uh, the Spanish Foundation for Science and Technology, decided that we were going to be offering uh, webinars about the course. So we launched five webinars with hundreds of participants again. And it was fun because we um, we wanted to get to know the people that were taking the course. So we very much made the effort on it every in in every single session, try to mingle with the audience, make them talk. We even created some role playing online, which was like super the very first time that we did something like that. So it was fantastic. And of course, and finally, the impact we've had, I mean, the, the figures of the online course are just amazing, but also the Open Doors Exchange program that Maria was mentioning. We wanted to test um, if there was an appetite for people um, bringing together researchers into their own institutions. And we put together what we call the European Science Diplomacy Tour. Uh, which was basically a tour when we could travel uh, to the embassies of Spain in Brussels and London, to the European Space Agency in Germany, to the Ministry of Euro uh, Education and Research in, in Germany as well, to the DLR premises. So it was like a very nice tour for researchers to, to get to mix and mingle with the uh, science diplomacy community. And we had so many expressions of interest from different institutions and equally a, a huge amount of researchers wanting to actually be part of that Open Doors program. We are going to be launching a report in next week with our learnings of the program and hopefully encouraging many different institutions in Europe to do such a, a such as this kind of exchange programs in between researchers and, and science diplomats and diplomats in general. Mm -hmm. so that would be my three super uh, proud to be aspects. Thank you very much, Jesus Kuhn, for taking us down memory lane. We have certainly come a long way since the wonderful conference in Madrid. And uh, the Madrid Declaration was certainly a very good starting point. Thank you also for pointing out the collaborative side of science diplomacy. It does certainly not mean work in an ivory tower. It means networking, getting together, and being open and curious, right? So I will turn to Maria again. Uh, would you share your experiences with us regarding the achievement of your objectives? Do you have some tricks up your sleeve how you achieved the objectives you set yourself for this project? Thank you very much for this important question, Susanna. Mm -hmm. I believe achievements are always very important and to look back what was, uh, what were the achievements of our strategic approach, I would say. Um, I. I uh, have three, three points, uh, I think, uh, which are very important from my point of view. Having a good starting point is key, and we have it, because we, we have a, a, a very uh, huge expertise uh, in the field of science diplomacy. Um, our colleagues uh, have developed uh, nine case studies, uh, different policy papers, and we have uh, had also a baseline analysis of um, needs of the professionals uh, working in the, the interface between science and diplomacy and policy. And I think this is very important to understand what we need for trainings and for whom we are doing these training activities. Our in-person training have also been evaluated, and I, I think this was also very important for the preparation of the online training, because we, we have better understood the needs of our target group. The second point is building on diversity diversity in our team because we have so different perspectives. We have university involved in our teams with the strategic and analytical part. We have uh, um, 
um, experts um, dealing with different ministries like myself uh, working on the behalf of the Federal Ministry for Education and Research, but we have also the diplomatic expertise um, from your organization actually. So uh, this is the mixture which is very important when you are dealing with such co complex topic like science diplomacy. And I think we have combined all this knowledge and different perspectives on the best way. And finally, motivation and also good public relations. They are also very important. Our team was very motivated to do it. We were very convinced that this is an important topic. And finally, thanks to our coordinators at SI, we have uh, established a very good um, social media strategy and also dissemination activities. And I believe this is why we are so visible at the moment and we have achieved all uh, these um, um, participations in our activities. Thank you, Maria. Yes, the, the outreach efforts were really tremendous and also highly successful. I cannot but underline this observation. But of course, we also faced a number of challenges on our path through the project. And uh, last but not least, the COVID pandemic broke out in the midst of our meetings and of our plannings. So I'm quite curious to hear from you, Isa Skun, um, which challenges you met uh, during the project and how you mastered them. Thank you, Susan. So, I mean, many challenges, Day, but if I focus in the challenges that we need, needed to tackle when designing all these training activities, I would say that targeting who we were addressing the training for was really complicated. I mean, we are thinking about researchers doing research in a lab, but also diplomats, uh, some other professionals at the international relations uh, sphere, and we somehow needed to find something attractive for all of them. And that was certainly a challenge. I mean, we have a one European uh, science diplomacy course that is meant to be attractive enough for all those different stakeholders. That was a, certainly a challenge. And also the question, what for? What are we training them for? Because it is also true that the science diplomacy path is still uncertain. There are not so many jobs that explicitly uh, look for science diplomats or, or science diplomacy experts. So um, we wanted to also somehow balance the expectations of those taking the course, because I mean, there's there, there is a field with lots of potential, but it is also true that still work in progress and sometimes uh, we even thought that the course would be meaningful and useful even for those professionals that are not uh, thinking on changing jobs. I mean we truly think that this uh, online course is going to be useful also for somebody in the lab that is not doesn't have a change in mind but Hopefully, this, this kind of training is going to make them uh, do their regular job with a fresh view or with a new ways of, of understanding what they are uh, doing. And the other challenge, which is something that needs to be mentioned, I think, is how to involve diplomats more into the, into the training courses. I mean, that this is something that needs to be, I think, further discussed and evolved after the project. Because it is true that we have had uh, champions in the diplomatic world. I mean, Susan is certainly one of, of them and many, many like Susan. But it is also true that we see certain um, a reluctancy to, to participate in this kind of uh, activities from the diplomatic world. And that, that needs to be understood better, I think. I mean, we had a huge, huge interest from the research community. And I would say that maybe not so much from the diplomatic world. Thank you, Isas Kohn, for this observation. Uh, yes, it is true, we, uh, we enjoy an overwhelming response from the world of science. The diplomats are also very open to the concept, and this is why we also, as a diplomatic academy, offer tailor-made training workshops for all governments, uh, public institutions, who wish to um, offer maybe also mid-career training uh, for their public officials. And of course, we integrate science diplomacy in various aspects. We mainstreamed uh, this idea into the curricula of our academy for our students. So yes, uh, science diplomacy has to get into the mainstream of our work on both sides in both stakeholder groups. 
we have to speed up a little bit because we have five minutes left. So I would ask uh, Maria for a very quick answer. Uh, how would you see the impact of uh, the training we have developed? Oh, well, uh, probably it's too early to, to talk about impact, but uh, we see some positive trends. Uh, and I would uh, like to uh, mm -hmm. say uh, four of them. The first one is the increased awareness among different stakeholders. The second is probably the motivation to, to contribute to the exchange among um, um, experts, scientists, and uh, also um, diplomats, especially in our online course, we um, have seen a lot of interaction in the science, uh, science diplomacy community. Um, furthermore, we have also realized that the learning curve rose sharply among our uh, trainees. Uh, this uh, sh has shown our evaluation. And finally, um, the question is, of course, how to go further with, uh, with our cooperation among our partners. And um, I, I believe this is also a success that we would like to continue um, offering such kind of activities uh, jointly, and uh, this will be a topic for, for tomorrow. So just very briefly from my side. Thank you, Maria. Isa Skun, I would like to also finish uh, with a, a positive note. How would you summarize um, the success story of our training aspect of the Horizon 2020 project? Thank you, Susan. Well, I think that I would say radically that we have proven that there is a case for science diplomacy and that there is a case for networking science diplomats throughout Europe and, and the world. I mean, the, the amount of uh, participants to our courses, to our webinars, um, proof that there is, um, there is a momentum for, for this networking to, to keep going. And I would say that probably one of the reasons why we have some plans after the, the project to finish that will be announced tomorrow. Um, part of the reasons for our partners, our colleagues to decide on doing something after the project is precisely uh, the success of the trainings and the networking events. So I think that, um, as, as I say, it has proven that there is a case and that we need to, to keep working on, on the science diplomacy sphere. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much, Isa Skun. I was just informed by Maximilian Hook, a member of my team who has uh, with a lot of energy supported the process in the last uh, three years. Max Hook is taking care of the management of questions and answers in this question. And um, I can see that we have received one question from the audience. Uh, thank you, Dieter Meissner, chemist. Uh, who uh, wishes to know the following things. In your teaching, how are you dealing with the contrast? I would call diplomacy the, is the art of compromise. In science, compromise is forbidden. Well, just a brief answer from my side, dear Dieter Meissner. Um, I think uh, I would not draw a sharp line between uh, the, two, uh, the two worlds of science and diplomacy. Of course, diplomacy means compromising, but diplomacy also uh, is targeted towards an aim. And then uh, when it comes to climate change, to security, to de denuclearization, there is sometimes very little leeway for compromise. So yes, diplomats also work in a very sharp and targeted way, I'm sure, as um, scientists do as well. And as when we take scientists on board of diplomatic delegations, you can rest assured that we uh, work hand in hand and have the best aim in mind we can achieve. Um, do you wish to answer that question as well, Maria or Itzas Kun? Is there a contrast in the, the art of compromising in our two worlds? Well, I mean, I think that contrast exists, but I mean, something that we, um, one of the very first things that we discuss with the researchers when we uh, offer them training is precisely for them to better understand that science is not the only dimension when it comes to diplomatic uh, decisions or, poli or, or policy decisions. There are many other dimensions that need to be taken into consideration. So it is not that we are claiming for science-based uh, policymaking, but science informs policymaking. We need to accept as scientists 
that there are many other dimensions that need to be taken into consideration in, in, in a complex diplomatic environment. Thank you, Isas Kohn. And by the way, Isas Kohn also holds a degree in chemistry. <laughs> Maria, just a brief last answer, and then I will uh, forward two questions to the following panel. But Maria first. I fully agree with uh, Isaac's, uh, Isaac's Kuhn. I think uh, we have to better understand the both world of science and diplomacy world. And um, I have nothing to add. Thank you. Thank you very much. So first of all, uh, I would like to thank the whole team um, who managed uh, this meeting. Thank you for Isaac Kuhn and Maria to being so open, sharing your experiences with us. And it has now uh, become uh, the point in time to share two questions we have jointly uh, elaborated for the panel, which will follow in a few seconds. Question number one, what are the main challenges while training science diplomats? What are the main challenges while training science diplomats? Second question, how can the success of training activities be measured? How can success of training activities be measured? Uh, it is a pleasure to end with these two questions and I will now hand over to the next panel. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, uh, Susanne, for this impressive uh, uh, conclusion and also for the two questions. Um, uh, dear ladies and gentlemen, uh, dear colleagues and partners, on behalf of uh, the uh, S4D4C team, I'm very glad to welcome you to our panel roundtable, Training the Future Generation of Science Diplomats. My name is Maria Justen. Since uh, 2005, I have been working at the German Aerospace Center for those who um, have not been involved in the previous spotlight session. Um, my colleague, Nadia Meyer, um, who has a huge experience in international collaboration, and um, I, we will um, be uh, glad uh, to chair this session today. Sophie von Knebel, also from the German Aerospace Center, will be responsible for the chat communication in the next hour. Thank you very much for that in advance, uh, Sophie. Let's start with the topic for our roundtable uh, today. Science diplomacy is important in times of global challenges and the pandemic has highlighted this again. As discussed in the spotlight, uh, there is no doubt that uh, exchange and capacity building is crucial. Um, Talk, when we are talking about science diplomacy. Global challenges require a cultural shift. Scientists and diplomats no, need to be prepared to work in a more um, collaborative and also in the, in the interdisciplinary way. Both communities, scientists and diplomats should be trained for a cultural change to better uh, address global challenges, for example, in the field of sustainable, the, uh, sustainable development goals. Several activities in this field have been already established uh, based on the gained experience within this round table. We will discuss many questions, but the main three questions are, as already mentioned by Susanne uh, in the spotlight, what are the main challenges while training? Uh, science diplomats, what are successful training activities? What is the success in training uh, activities? And what could be improved in the future? And uh, from my point of view, this is a very important question which we have to consider in our discussion today. Before starting with the exchange with our panelists, I would give you some general instructions um, how to proceed, how to interact. Um, the participants will have uh, the, the opportunity to use the chat on the one side um, for interacting among themselves and also to use the Q&A channel to pose some questions for the panelists. We could also consider some questions for the spot, for, from the spotlight um, at the end of our roundtable discussion. Communication is important, exchange is important, not only, uh, only among the panelists, but uh, also with the whole science diplomacy community. And we could, uh, we will use Twitter, we will tweet about the round table and uh, your support is very much welcome. So use our hashtag, science diplomacy net 2021. 
also to um, share your experiences with our S4G4C conference. And finally, this session will be recorded. We will also have some key statements which will be posted at our website. I would like to stop here and to give uh, the floor to Nadia for the introduction of our excellent panelists today. Nadia, the floor is yours now. Thank you very much, Maria. Hello, I'm Nadia Meyer from the DLR as well, and I'm part of the S4D team too. And now I would like to introduce you to our esteemed experts. I'm very happy that they're here today and can share with us their experiences. Um, first, uh, Alma Cristal Hernandez, would you be so kind to introduce yourself quickly? Thanks so much. Uh, well, uh, as you mentioned, my name is Alma. I'm from Mexico City. I work, work now for the science, uh, technology, science, technology and education ministry here in Mexico City. And we are, um, we launched a program for trained uh, scientists on science policy interface and that includes science diplomacy. It's my pleasure to stay here. Thank you. Thank you very much, Alma. We are glad you're here too. And now I would like to introduce uh, Emi Briggs from the Diplomatische Akademie Wien. Emi, would you say a few words about yourself? Sure. Uh, welcome from my side. I am a diplomat and a historian. Uh, and I uh, used to be Austrian ambassador in the United Kingdom and in Moscow in quite different places. Uh, and I have been now for more than three years director of the Diplomatische Akademie Wien. Thank you very much, Emil. Um, and now Leni Top from the uh, Joint Research Council. Uh, we're glad that you're here as well. Would you like to introduce yourself to the audience? Thank you, uh, Nadia. Thank you for having me. So my name is Lena. I work at the European Commission in Brussels, more precisely at the Joint Research Centre. And uh, the Joint Research Centre is 2,000 scientists that supports the EU policy making uh, in all kinds of areas, uh, energy, uh, health, uh, what have you. Uh, my particular function is to oversee the capacity building among the scientists that work at this interface between the science and policy. So thank you for having me. Thank you very much, Leni. And uh, now, last but not least, as we like to say, Meredith uh, Gore from the University of Maryland. Uh, what's your background? Hello, I'm Meredith Gore. I'm an associate professor in the Department of Geographical Sciences at University of Maryland. And I teach students in science policy. And I also have served as a Jefferson Science Fellow with the US Department of State and US Embassy Science Fellow um, to the US Mission to the African Union. So I have some experience um, being one of these boundary spanning academics. I'm so happy to be here and participate in this discussion today. Thank you very much, Meredith. Um, so uh, dear audience, you heard we have some very experienced experts here who all know very much about training, capacity building, either for diplomats or for young scientists. And uh, maybe we can build a bridge to the spotlight uh, session we had before because our colleagues uh, raised the questions for our panelists. And I would like to uh, take up the first one, which was what are the main challenges while training science, science diplomats? And what is uh, from your point of view, uh, a successful training? Meredith, maybe you would like to share your uh, experiences with us. Thank you so much. I would like to share my observations from my own experiences. Um, as we have already discussed, we have science diplomacy and scientists, and they're kind of two worlds. There can be two currencies. In science, the product is the ultimate goal. And in diplomacy, the process is a really important goal. And so when it comes to training, we need to make sure that we are providing exposure um, to both of these worlds. And so two of the main challenges that I see with this lack of exposure is a lack of collaboration and also a lack of a shared language. And so if what, what these kind of challenges result in are individuals who have a hard time going between the different systems, the diplomacy systems and the science systems. So I think when training activities are successful, um, I see two things. The first is that scientists are able to expand their scientific research outside the walls of the academy. I also see 
a diplomatic core that is better able to infer from scientific evidence in their day-to-day -day job. So those are two observations that I've had and I hope um, they provide some food for thought for the discussion. Thank you very much, uh, Meredith. Uh, that is something that we see in our trainings and in our experience as well. So I can uh, easily second that. And um, Alma, what is your experience regarding that? Would you also agree or have you, have you had uh, different expectations and experiences? Okay, thank you. Yes, um, I completely agree. And I have to express one more component. Uh, in my experience, one of the greatest challenges uh, that we have in this field uh, is to provide certainty about the professional future in this field. Uh, I think that um, in most countries, for example, Mexico and, 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 and others in this Latin American region, uh, we have not official positions for these specialists. So um, they are only usually requesting crisis situations, for example, now, COVID-19 crisis. Uh, so it's hard to get an expertise on a topic if you do that only occasionally, right? So for that reason, measuring the sex can be complex. Um, um, mostly if you work always in, well, of course, all the training programs are uh, very, very good, very, very necessary, uh, but, you need a real world experience. Um, and that's the, that, that, that um, I think that this is a good point for the next discussion. Thanks. Thank you very much, Alma. And I would like to give the floor to Amy because I'm quite sure that uh, he can also add uh, some observations from the diplomatic world, which is his sphere. Thank you. Thank you very much. I, I think the biggest challenge really is that we still have a very long way to go. That's my experience from the diplomatic field, from my own work. There is no mainstreaming uh, of, of the scientific world into the diplomatic experience that I have experienced for my last more than 30 years in the diplomatic world. So it's having a new narrative where we can include uh, and mainstream uh, uh, science diplomacy uh, is the biggest challenge uh, by far. Uh, and uh, I think uh, the way forward to doing this is, first of all, really make sure that we know that these are two different worlds. It may sound a bit strange. Uh, do not try to blunder and to, to say we are all the same and there is no confrontation. They are two worlds, different rules. We have to understand the different rules that exist. We have to understand the different languages of science and diplomacy. Uh, and we have to understand that those things that in science diplomacy we value so much, like communication, like trust, are very soft issues for most uh, diplomats and also maybe for, for, for many scientists. Uh, so the invest in, in, in trying to, in your training, trying to understand what communication really can mean, not only in, in, in soft words, but also in practice, and what trust building means, uh, and why possibly the issue of trust is maybe the biggest chance we have in making things understand. And my example, I finish here, my example is, is the COVID-19 crisis. This is a huge chance, chance really to reframe the story because suddenly there is so much interest in facts that normally in diplomacy facts are something that you make up yourself very often. But there is now facts that we are looking for. Uh, secondly, that we understand that science uh, is not something which cannot be challenged, but it is challenged all the time. So that is also something very important that the COVID crisis helps us to make people aware. And then it's the global response. It's the global response that we need with the COVID crisis. And this sort of huge chance, I would, I would say uh, we should use. Uh, so I, I sent a tweet which said, never let a good crisis go to waste. Thank you very much, Amy. These are some good words for us and a good advice as well. Uh, Lini, I saw you nodding while Amy was uh, speaking and elaborating. <laughs> Would you like to add something? 
Well, I, I can only agree with, with what all the other panelists have, have already said um, about, you know, the finding a common language and so on and realizing that we are from different worlds and different backgrounds. What I maybe wanted to focus on was that um, for a, a training to be in, have an impact, it's not enough just to do the training and, and then uh, afterwards you're, you're, you're okay. You need to do follow up afterwards. Um, just recently, I heard somebody say that these smiley surveys you do after the training. So when you do evaluations just after the training and people reply, oh, this was great, I learned a lot. And we might think that we did well then and we are, we are okay. We finished our job, but we haven't. Because if trainings are to be impactful, it's not enough to provide new knowledge and new skills. These have to be applied. And only when they are being applied, Will we actually have an impact? So um, at the JSC, at the Joint Research Center, we've kind of changed the way we evaluate the trainings. We now put in um, in the evaluation questionnaire, of course, what subjects did you like, what didn't you like, and then we put in what three things will you change now in the next month? What actions will you take? What three things will you do differently? Um, maybe I'll now follow more closely as a scientist political news, something like that. And then we actually follow up with them so that we, on a monthly basis, we reconnect online. Um, so this kind of keeps people on their toes. Uh, if somebody faces difficulties, you can, you can help them along and it builds a community. So I think this is extremely important that we don't see the training as a one-off thing, but it's actually a continuous uh, process. Thank you. Thank you very much, Lena. I, I must um, uh, underline, and um, I am not. I were not in while you were speaking as well, because we made this experience in the S4040C project as well. We evaluated our trainings and try to follow up um, on the results. That that's for sure. But I would like to hand over to Maria, who will pose the next uh, question to our speakers, and I think it's another one from our spotlight session. Thank you very much, uh, Nadia. Thank you very much for your contribution and for uh, mentioning the two different worlds. Uh, and I think uh, this is a good key, key word for, for the next question. Starting by scientists. Scientists have an obligation and um, an opportunity to help to inform science policy. They could also support diplomats building um, bridges in situation where um, the usual policy and diplomatic channels do not work. But uh, of course, they should trust the diplomats and the uh, policy makers that uh, their sci scientific partnerships or their scientific results will not be abused. And that is the question, how to build trust? And um, I would like to start with Alma. Alma, you are a chemist as a, a scientist leading um, science advising efforts in Mexico, you know best the challenges in the communication with diplomats and uh, policy stakeholders. And um, surely this is a topic in your trainings. Um, have you, uh, how have you ensured the building of trust among your trainees? Well, it's a, <laughs> a real question, a very good question. And I think that this is one of the biggest challenges in all the training uh, programs. Because, you know, in, in a controlled environment and with the help of experts in the area, you can anticipate uh, what will be the most common challenges for a, a doctor maybe who has just graduated or is uh, in the, in, the uh, in early stage of his career or her career. And, or that maybe he or she has not worked outside of the academy. Um, so giving some tips uh, in the, for the real world, um, it's, it's very uh, good for, for day. Uh, the trainings are very useful for attack and prevent some of the most common mistakes in the political arena or in, in these international issues that, that you can involve. For example, uh, as mentioned before, cultural aspects or for a, a protocol, uh, I don't know, man, which you do not learn in the academy will, while you are uh, training to be a, science, a scientist in uh, physics, chemistry, or uh, so on, right? So uh, training with the help for someone who has already experienced it or 
maybe can guide you in a theoretical learning is essential for the diplomats for 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 the trust that the diplomats can develop uh, that gives a confidence uh, a confidence in front of uh, stakeholders in in i think that uh, this gives uh, you confidence in front of stakeholders because he knows he or she knows that is not dealing with another pure sciences that so that only speak one languages in in, in our area so uh, i think that this is one of the most challenges thank you Thank you very much indeed. We have also made the experience. This is very challenging procedure to, uh, to build trust. And uh, of course, uh, cultural aspects should be always taken into consideration when we are talking about such kind of training activities and building trust. Thank you very much for your answer. And um, I would like to ask Meredith. Um, Meredith, you, um, you are dealing with trainings for young scientists, and I believe that uh, building trust in an early career stage is crucial. How have you managed that? I think it's a really good question, and I, I can share from my own experience, um, training in communication can be really important. So two things is the format of science communication to diplomats. Diplomats like the bottom line up front. Scientists, we like to go really slow and end with the bottom line. So even just making sure that individuals that are being trained know that the format of communication is completely different in these spaces. And vocabulary is totally different. So when you say the word analysis to a scientist, they're going to start thinking about confidence intervals and statistical analysis. But analysis in a diplomatic space could just be critical thinking and a real um, like dissection of a particular text. So I think that communication training on the format and vocabulary of our different spaces is really important. But when it comes to trust, in my experience, when students are provided a safe space to fail and fail together, they learn from that failure. And I call it failing forward. So when we fail together, we learn and we also build trust and it also enhances relationships. So how do you create a safe space to fail is the question. And I try to share my failures with my students. I think that we talk a lot about successes. I don't think that we talk a lot about failures. And so mentoring those, of, those individuals that are in leadership positions can really try to enable safe space for failure and asking questions. So those are a few things that I hope continue uh, contribute to the discussion in this section. Thank you very much. Uh, failure culture is uh, a, an important keyword, I, I believe. Um, and I would like to continue with uh, uh, Lene. Uh, you have co-authored an article on knowledge management for policy impact. And uh, you have also uh, described skill sets for, for researchers working at the science policy interface. Could you please a little, uh, elaborate a little bit more about that and also in the context of building trust? Yes, thank you, Maria. Um, when we start the capacity building in the DSC, we, we thought we need first to map the skills because those are when you work at the interface, those are complementary skills and very few universities are teaching them. Uh, so this is why we, we, we did this mapping where we said, okay, if you are, we did for, for researchers, if you're one of the researchers working at the interface, what is it then you need in addition to being a good researcher? And this is this, yeah, communication, we call it to a non-scientific audience, because as Meredith said, it's very different communicating with a scientific audience and a non-scientific audience. It's understanding the policy world, it's also working interdisciplinary. So rarely do we have that one uh, expert has all the answers to a policy problem because they are they're wicked, they're complex. So you need to uh, learn to work across disciplines with other scientific experts. You need to learn to, to synthesize research because again, as, as Meredith said, uh, the, the policymakers or the diplomats won't read the whole long report. So you need to be able to synthesize it in relation to the policy problem at hand. You need to be able to, to interact with, with citizens. 
because there's also a lot of information, a lot of values, a lot of needs, user needs uh, from citizens coming. But I think the most important is that with this skills map, we're not uh, looking for superhumans. So we're not saying that everybody should have all these skills. We're saying that this is a collective skill set. So as a department, as a unit, you may have this collective skill set, but no, no one person can, can have all these skills. So it's more a matter of building up a collective skill set than it is to, to be superhuman. Thanks. Thank you very much. Uh, very interesting. Um, uh, the collection of different skills needed for, for researchers and uh, your experience in e-learning courses and online courses. Uh, I'm sure you have um, much more recommendations we, which we will hear later on. Now moving from uh, the science to the diplomacy, Emil, you were uh, Austrian ambassador in several countries. Uh, you uh, have made a lot of experience in the field of science diplomacy and also as a director of the Vienna School of International Studies, you are responsible for building future diplomats. What is your view? How can your training support uh, diplomats in finding the right experts, the right scientific outcome uh, and sources, and also to network with the scientific community. This might be a challenge for the diplomacy part. And I would be very curious to hear your view. This is a nice challenge and an important challenge that we have. And actually at the Vienna School of International Studies, we educate not only for diplomats, uh, but we educate for international professions. Uh, and that includes a lot of, 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 of jobs where you need to, to understand what, what scientists are doing. Uh, so that's one of the reasons why one of our master courses is on environmental technology and international affairs. And in such a course, our students have to take one year of international relations theory and one year of talking about environmental technology, learn about environmental technology. And we do this, this with a technological university at Vienna. So this interaction is, I think, something which even in a diplomatic school is very necessary from the very beginning. And there is not a single course where we don't have also this interaction with science from the very beginning. Uh, and uh, as, I, as I see it, uh, what's important and what you need to have in diplomatic education from the beginning is this demand to work interdisciplinary this, and multidisciplinary. Uh, so again, a school like ours, that, that's obvious that we have chairs in history, international relations, international law, international economics, that is simply important. Uh, and when you do this, from the point of view of, of diplomatic education, the, the most important uh, thing really is to have a sound academic education. That sounds very old fashioned, but the sound academic uh, uh, education, that's why, for instance, we here, we demand from our students that they uh, really do research, that they really go into research issues and not only learn how the protocol works or, or uh, how, I don't know, how you can relate to different cultures, very important. Uh, but still, they have to have a sound academic background. Uh, and by having this, learn the rules of science, of various scientific uh, fields that, that you have. have. Uh, but still, uh, the basic challenge that we have here in, 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 from the diplomatic side is that what we teach really is always directed towards values. Values is the thing that we want to, to, to sell to our students, uh, and especially to future diplomats. Uh, and I learned from, uh, from the feedback of the students. Our student body comes from um, all sorts of social sciences, uh, humanities, uh, lawyers, but also we also have scientists, uh, medical doctors, uh, even people from the arts world. Uh, and what I learned there is that they all are eager to discuss at this sort of educational sphere values. And that's something where we come together, actually, where it's very easy. Certainly, the value system that, that 
our, our students are looking for is a liberal world order, whatever that means. And now we are back in, in diplomacy and politics because uh, this is something where uh, you have to find a balance between are you teaching facts? Are you teaching what's, what's, what, what, what's going on in geopolitics? And how can you in integrate this, uh, your value system? And I think what is very helpful there is this sort of, of, of uh, relations to, to, to sciences and, and the facts we have from science. Uh, even very basic ideas like progress, that science means progress, is something which we try to include also in how we educate diplomats. I hope I gave you some ideas of how we try to, to give the mix here. Thank you very much also for your recommendations uh, to, to get diplomats into the experience, uh, to experience um, um, research generally and to, to have some sound academic background, um, uh, which is important for having this diplomatic and scientific view in one person. I think this is uh, this is crucial. And regarding values, uh, this is one of our 10 matters um, which were prepared by colleague by our S4G4C colleagues. Values is very important when we are talking about, uh, about science diplomacy. And I believe this is a big topic um, which we will not cover in detail today, but um, uh, thank you for mentioning that. Uh, talking about recommendations, uh, we have also made the experience within our S4G4C project and I would like just to give you some insight uh, what we would uh, recommend um, when we are talking about training activities. Uh, first of all, um, we would recommend empowering researchers and diplomats to work together in different fields. Um, in our case, we are talking about global challenges, sustainable development goals, uh, but um, also we have uh, mentioned uh, social, social science, science and humanities as important topics which should be taken into consideration. Uh, it's also important to uh, uh, diversify um, different career paths for scientists and diplomats. It was uh, already confirmed uh, by all of our panelists. Uh, it's important to interact between the different worlds. And I think it's also important to have some fellowship schemes for scientists uh, to encourage them to work in international organizations um, uh, like UN or in European organizations like uh, EAS or in ministries um, and further research international activities. And finally, um, last, last but not least, um, diplomats uh, should be also trained in understanding of scientific processes. And this was the last topic uh, which uh, has been mentioned from our panelists. Next slide, please. Finally, when we are talking about curriculum, we think we have to cover a very broad thematic uh, spectrum. We have to, uh, independence, of course, uh, um, on the target group. When we are uh, dealing with beginners, we have to, um, uh, to provide them information about the definitions of science diplomacy or the understanding of science diplomacy, and also to, uh, to underline some critical points uh, where are the limits of science diplomacy. We have to also to offer um, information about stakeholders and national and regional approaches or thematical approaches. When we are talking about science diplomacy, there are different kinds of uh, activities in water diplomacy, cyber security, open science diplomacy, and so on and so on. And finally, we have already mentioned skills are very important, especially at the early career development stage. In-person training should uh, offer a mixture from our point of view, a mixture between scientists and diplomats just to, to bring these both worlds together and to give them the chance to interact. And online training should be also established very interactively um, with probably additional webinars and meetings and chances to, to, to exchange ideas. This is crucial when we are training um, science diplomacy. And finally, networking uh, and sustainable um, connection between the alumni is also very important from our point of view. These are just some ideas. And I think um, 
our panelists has much more recommendations, I would hang over to Nadia for the next question. Thank you so much, Maria. But before I come back to our panelists, I would really quickly like to um, address the audience and um, have your idea about um, good training. So I will pose you a question, maybe Sophie, you can pose it into the chat as well. And the question is, if you meet a genie in a bottle and you have one single wish related to the design of trainings in the field of science diplomacy, what would it be? You can pose your answers into the chat. I'm very curious to see what your um, ideas and thoughts about this are. And we'll come back to that later. And uh, I would like to address uh, the panelists again with a question a little bit similar to this one, uh, but a little bit more concrete as well. So what actions or concrete actions and changes would you recommend um, to better implement and improve science diplomacy trainings and for which actors might that be or uh, which actors would you address these recommendations to um alma would you like to uh, to share your thoughts about this i'm sure you have uh, thought about this as well how to um, um change um the existing trainings a little bit more for the better Okay, thank you. Uh, well, for in the future, um, in one of the main challenges that I have observed in science diplomacy, in a lot of science diplomacy workshops that I have participated, um, is a referral lack of, I don't know how to say, maybe sensibility in political issues, in, pro in policy processes, maybe. Um, for example, if you are a science diplomat or you have a seat in the table, right? But you don't have a vote. So this is not completely understand, understood for all the participants because, um, uh, for example, when there is a simulation or a negotiation, for example, with stakeholders, such as businessmen, ministries, ministries of, part of several disciplines, politicians, and other stakeholders uh, in, in the process, uh, that in the real world that implies that everyone has different different backgrounds right and um, but when you have a workshop for science for scientists uh, they think <laughs> well not all is not general but it's very common that they think that the rational side always win you know and that is a terrible mistake it doesn't have in in the in the real world, it doesn't happen. Uh, for that reason, I believe that it's essential to introduce an initial course uh, on this different practice uh, in the science policy interface, in, this, in the policy processes, in, in maybe even in the, um, uh, in the difference between the legislative, executive, uh, you know, branch. And, uh, and 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 sensitive uh, sensitize these participants about the real operation and teach the uh, uh, the, the tools for for uh, in order to manage these kind of situations with people who don't have the, your experience your background your belief in science and scientific evidence so um it can be difficult, but I think that it's completely necessary if you want to have a real impact. That's fine. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Alma. Um, I can second that. Um, I wonder if you would put those different target groups also together or wh whether you would um, like to separate them in the trainings, but maybe uh, some of the other uh, panelists can come back to this. Um, what is uh, uh, a successful way to teach what we want to teach? Lainey, what are your thoughts on that? I think based on our experiences in training that the scientist was um, we, we started in 2017 and we had the excellent knowledge, uh, you know, expert with excellent knowledge that, that delivered the training. But then we realized that something was missing and it was that we didn't have a, a trained trainer, a facilitator, because facilitation of a group of people is a skill as it is to be a chemist or, or, or something. So we now have a, a duo of trainers 
one with a, with a more kind of knowledge background in, in the in the field and then a facilitator so somebody who's skilled in when you do role plays how do you bring about you know the the difficult questions how do you manage a discussion how do you make sure that everybody speak in the room uh, how do you create this safe space because if you don't have the safe space people would not share their failures and as Meredith said often we learn more from failures than from successes so for us uh, it was a learning curve to really um, so you need the, the knowledge, of course, about science diplomacy, but you also need this facilitation experience to manage the group. And I would say we are only in brackets training scientists in, in our group, but I would imagine that it's even more important when you have different uh, people in, so you have scientists, diplomats and so on, that it would be even more important to, to create the safe space and have somebody who's skilled in facilitating this process and that uh, discussion. Thank you. Thank you, Lainey. Uh, Amy, you, you've talked about your experiences uh, in this regard in the uh, Diplomatische Akademie uh, already a little and told us about it before, but I, uh, if, if you could change your curricula and, and, and make it even a little bit different, what would be uh, your first move? Well, our first move would, would, really, would really be to be even more multidisciplinary than we are now. So really to start uh, talking from various disciplines. Uh, and actually, we are, we are trying this next move. Uh, we are working with uh, computer special. We will work with computer specialists, technological uh, in innovators, machine learning experts, artificial intelligence experts, uh, and offer a, a common two years master uh, on, on digital international relations. So I would always try to go for, for those issues uh, which are relevant for a society in the future and for global relations in the future. So that's for me very obvious. But in 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 where I see that there is a a need actually to to go forward, and I listen to what Lena said especially. Also, uh, I learned that um, if we have a target group uh, of scientists in in our trainings and courses, we need to tell them that scientists never win. Scientists never win. But it's important that they understand that. Uh, when you do science diplomacy, certainly we're looking for evidence, informed or even based policies. Uh, we are looking for defining what the common good is. But at the end, uh, there is a balance, always a balance between interest. Again, the COVID crisis tells us we have to have a balance between the various sides. And finally, policy making is not only based on facts, it's not only based on rationality, it's based on things that we teach also like emotional intelligence and things like that. And I think that we have, there we have to, to, to start to, to, make, to make that clear that uh, as a diplomat, uh, you always have a balancing act, which is different from, uh, from decision making and even the processes of scientists. Uh, and uh, as a diplomat, you have, and that is very practical, you follow your national interest, but at the same time, you're convinced that there is some common good which goes beyond the national interest. And that's, there is the balancing act that you have to, uh, have to find. Uh, and we need some scientific think tanks for the national interest for and we need social scientists and and, and, and and whatnot for the national interest but for the common good we need all scientific experience that there is and that's the balancing act that we have uh, and where i see that we should really uh, try to uh, to go beyond what we do now is we should actually convince every university around the globe that this is an important issue every university and most of the universities don't understand that uh, in, within the organizational thinking that that is something that is also in their own interest uh, to work on and that's a huge, huge issue where we can maybe raise awareness do something to make that possible Thank you very much, Amy. I'm not sure whether the audience could follow this, but in the background here, when Amy was saying that uh, every university should uh, make it a priority and should understand that this is very important, Lini and Meredith were very happy and clapping their hands and, 
and seconding it. So yes, you made a point, I think. Um, and Meredith, I would like to hand the word to you. I'm sure we, I know and I saw that you agree very much with, uh, with what Emil said, but I'm sure you have uh, another observation or suggestion or, um, on how to change uh, or how to make uh, science diplomacy trainings even better. Yeah, I, I, I appreciate the opportunity to go last here because I agree 100% with what everybody said. Um, excellent, excellent points. So the only thing that I can add is one dimension that science and diplomacy share is the really, really, really slow, change is really slow in both of these sectors. And I see a huge opportunity to modernize in terms of diversity. And so I, I see trainings could be improved um, by, by enhancing diversity, modernizing the bodies of diplomacy and the bodies of science. So diversity in the science. Science diplomacy is not just about natural science. It's also about social science. We have human migration, climate change impacts. These are, these are also human dimensions. We also have bench and applied sciences. So yes, going to Mars, you know, all these amazing nanoparticles, but then also applied sciences like biodiversity conservation, deforestation. And then I also see a lot of minoritized scientists not being included in the discussion. And so not all scientists uh, look like me. Uh, and, and so we need to have a diverse body of scientists and a diverse body of diplomats that are engaging here because I think that that is really what's reflecting the current, the current day. So something to add. Thank you, Meredith, uh, for this. Um... For this uh, impression, yes, I think modernizing the bodies and including social sciences might be a, a good way to go. I would also second that, if I may say that. And um, I would like to hand over because I've seen there are some or a lot of uh, um, questions and also comments in the chat. And I would like to hand over to Sophia Maria. Um, maybe they can uh, have, have us participate in these questions and address them to our panelists. Thank you very much, Nadia. And thank you to all participants for, for the active um, yeah, participation in the chat and uh, with regards to questions as well. Um, first of all, there, there was a lot of support with regard to the necessity to follow up and promote the implementation of the elements learned during trainings that was discussed in the beginning. And uh, now I think Maria is coming back to it. Um, there's a lot of discussions um, how how important it is as well to, to get to know um, the different languages and start very early to, to learn how to translate and how to relate to both fields. But coming to the questions that, that were posed by, by some of the participants. Um, one was science diplomacy theory and concepts and various case studies and qualitative quantitative research work can be done in a well-organized training program. But this participant would like to know what kind of possibilities are there to get realistic experience on the diplomacy domain with policy making, negotiations, et cetera. This is uh, to all panelists. So whoever wants to start. I can maybe because it's, a, it's directed towards diplomacy. So there are always chances for brief stays as em at embassies or foreign ministries uh, uh, to, to get involved uh, for some time. Uh, and that is coming more and more to the fore, more and more ministries are offering this because that's also diversity for them uh, to get scientists on board for, for, for some brief, at least brief time. Uh, and I would recommend to, to try and ask for it. Uh, for instance, uh, our students here at the Vienna School of International Studies, they, all of them actually go for a short period uh, to also diplomatic institutions or also sometimes uh, 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 science, scientific institutions uh, to get this experience simply. Thank you very much, Emil. The next question is on 
a participant uh, mentioned that he's uh, still bedazzled by how different the concept of science diplomacy is interpreted, maybe uh, in the US via the European context. And uh, it seems that in the US, science diplomacy um, has become a term that increasingly circumscribes all kinds of teaching and awareness raising of the relevance of um, STEM subject education, also and especially for the US context itself. Has science diplomacy turned into a domestic graft? Meredith, you were just reacting to the question. Maybe you want to respond. I, are there other are there other people from the U.S. on the panel? Um, so, so yes, I think I think there is a difference. Um, I can't answer the question: Has science diplomacy turned into a domestic craft? But what I see um, is that we have science for diplomacy, science in diplomacy, and then diplomacy of science. So. Um, that's the way that I was kind of trained as a scientist to engage in my science diplomacy. And then as I've supported, as a scientist who supports diplomats, um, I try to remember those kind of three dimensions. I guess I might also say that, uh, you know, foreign, there's like, you know, international relations, but it also relies on domestic dimensions. And so I, I think that there's a little bit of an opportunity to think about science diplomacy at a very micro level also. So I, t I tend to think about, um, you know, I do some community-based research in the state of Michigan or, um, you know, in the greater Limpopo or in Kruger National Park you know, so in South Africa or in the United States, and even working with communities, there's, there's diplomacy going on at those like micro levels. So um, I tend to be a big tent thinker in that regard, but I can certainly see um, important questions being raised by this point and the differences in our systems, I think are worth discussing and exploring further. So thanks for that question. It's, it's a hard one. <laughs> Thank you very much, Meredith. Alma, there was a question to you. Could you please uh, talk a little bit about the science diplomacy program taking place in Mexico? Yeah, thanks. Well, uh, this is, um, uh, I think that the program is a little more general. It's on science policy interface. You know, it's everything about uh, the, the, the relation between these disciplines and, um, for, of course, policy includes uh, all the diplomatics fields. Um, well, uh, two years ago, we launched uh, this program in the uh, in the, in the Ministry of the City, uh, and we have uh, six persons uh, with a PhD in several fields working in uh, six um, ministries. Uh, for example, health, uh, environment. Um, the economical development uh, and so on. So um, they are uh, in this kind of, of they, they, the first step of this program was um, a general course on several topics includes science diplomacy. Uh, and we want to, we add a special uh, training in, in this, kind of relations in the in all the political processes um, this is this was our first generations maybe the 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 only one because you know in 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 mexico in, in countries like mexico there are not much not much support on these fields because there are uh, extended beliefs that this is not a real work so it's it's hard to <laughs> to manage this uh, and it's uh, of course it, it is very interesting for the uh, early career researchers we have a lot of successful with with these people because uh, they want to contribute to the society more than publish a paper or i don't know you know so uh, i think that uh, most countries uh, if, if you can if you can uh, have any specific questions on on this uh, program uh, please uh, Write me a, 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 an email, and, and I uh, I will enjoy to to answer that. And I, I want to to ask for 
for all the people that are hearing here uh, to pushing in to push in our countries to create these kind of capacities. You know, it's maybe we can uh, working in a network. For example, now in in the the, the Inter American uh, Institute for Global Research launched a program last, uh, the, the last year, and now we are working four countries and I think that this could be useful for uh, for nations, countries like Mexico uh, and others in, in, in similar situations. Uh, thanks. Thank you very much, Alma, and thank you as well for the offer to just contact you directly. Um, coming to our last question, um, global Challenges require joint efforts by scientists and diplomats on a worldwide scale. Finding a common language where both words, science and diplomacy, can be regarded as epistemic communities who share common values and norms, and both can engage in finding solutions for humanity and global politics and international relations. How can science diplomacy, besides training programs, uh, enable a constructive dialogue to engage scientists and diplomats in a common effort? to figure out solutions for, for global challenges. Lene, maybe you want to respond to this question. Yeah. It's a really long one, sorry. Yeah, it's a long one, I'm, I'm trying to remember. <laughs> um, it's, it's how can, what else can you do than training, right? Yeah, it's um, yeah. Yeah, exactly, besides training programs, um, how yeah. can you have a constructive dialogue? Yeah, I think um, um, you don't build one off dialogues, you build, you know, it's a long term relationship. So I think a common mistake is that, oh, I need this information as the policymaker or the scientist, I have this report and then, you know, that, that rarely works. So it's, you have to um, think of it as a long term investment. Uh, and I think you have to think of it as a collaboration. Uh, so it takes time, it takes energy, it, you have to compromise because the, you know, the, the other party might be doing it differently, but it might be better, you know, so I think you have to go in with an open mindset and then you have to go in with it as this is, this is not, not just one off, I'm here for the longer run. Um, and then I think we talked about also before that um, if as a diplomat you go in and you contact one scientist, well, you might not get the full answer because no single person knows an answer to a complex policy problem. So to from the out say, out uh, said no, that you will have to involve a group of, of, of people and that it requires iterations back and forth. So really to be willing to make the investment of, of a long-term relationship. Thank you very much. And thank you very much for all your answers. And then I give back to Maria and Nadia. Thank you very much, Sophie, for summarizing all questions. Um, I um, want to thank also to, to all panelists for, for the lively discussion. And I think uh, Ginny will have a lot of think, uh, things to do <laughs> because there, are, there is a need, for example, to, to start trainings at a very early stage of, um, of career development to learn different languages uh, for the different um, uh, worlds of um, science and diplomacy, but also uh, to include some uh, management aspects when we are talking about scientific uh, trainings for scientists in science diplomacy, or for, for example, to discuss uh, um, more about uh, global interest um, versus national objectives. This is also very important for uh, training in science diplomacy. Diversity was uh, has been also mentioned several times, and I think these are all keywords um, also mentioned by our panelists today. And um, I would like uh, also to conclude with my wish uh, to a genie in a bottle. I would wish that all organizations dealing with international science and technology cooperation uh, organize regular science diplomacy trainings involving different stakeholders and establishing a sustainable exchange among their alumni. 
So with that, I would like to go uh, back to, to Nadia. Nadia, thank uh, you, Maria. The floor is yours now. Yes, thank you. There's not much more to say. Maria uh, wrapped up very nicely, and thank you for that. And I would like to extend my thank to the panelists, of course. Thank you so much for sharing all your insights and your experiences with us. By, but I would also like to thank also the audience again for being so lively involved in the chat and with the questions that we had here. And I hope you can take away something. But before you now go back to your work or your lives or the next session, because we have some sessions coming up here in the S4D4C final conference um, still, I would like to ask Javier, uh, Javier, our uh, artist who does some graphical recording of our panels to show us his work about this training session, uh, because his art is really incredible and I would like to share it with you now. And as you can see, um, all the keywords um, and all the main topics that we have been discussing, um, he, he, he caught them up and put them on paper, the trust, the diversity, the values. Uh, yeah, and I think those are the main elements for training the next generation of science uh, diplomats. And with that, right on time, I say thank you very much for your participation. Hope to see you and uh, read you all again very soon. Thank you very much and goodbye. <laughs>